All right, so now we're going to move on and to our next speaker. Her name is Anne Baring. She's going to speak on the dream of the cosmos. And welcome to the symposium. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here, very honored to be here. Now, I want to just share my screen, see if it works. I'm going to give you a panoramic view of five cosmologies that have had a profound effect on the development of Western civilization, beginning with the cosmology of the lunar era of the Great Mother. This was a cosmology of profound connection and relationship. The philosopher Owen Barfield called it original participation. To understand something of immense importance that was lost millennia ago, we need to go back to the Neolithic era when the cosmos was imagined as a mother from whose womb all forms of life emerged in a continuous cycle of birth, death, and regeneration. What we now call cosmos and nature was a living web of relationships ensouled by the great mother. Life was an organic, living, and sacred whole, and we were part of that whole. The Milky Way was the starry passage by which souls entered and left this world, and the shamanic journey into other dimensions of reality was the spiritual experience throughout this era. The most important idea about this time is that there was no creator beyond creation, no separation between the Great Mother as source or womb and the myriad forms of her life. No separation, therefore, between spirit and nature. All life was one. Just as the stars emerged each night from the darkness of the night sky, so the visible universe was born from the dark mystery of the invisible. Everything was infused with divinity because each and all were part of a sacred cosmic order, the web of life of the Great Mother. The cosmology of the lunar era was focused on a cyclical process of birth, death, and regeneration that arose from the age-old observation of the recurring phases of the moon, its birth as a crescent, its waxing to fullness, and its waning into the three days of darkness. Out of that darkness, the crescent was continually reborn. Light and darkness, life and death were not polarized as they were to become in the subsequent era, but were two phases of a total cycle, always leading to regeneration and a new cycle. Woman was revered because like nature, the great mother, she was the carrier of new life. The 10 lunar months of gestation were associated with the swelling of the crescent moon as it rose to fullness. Through an expanded consciousness, assisted by the use of psychedelic plants, people in the lunar era had a sense of kinship with all creation. They saw their lives as part of the great cosmic cycle of birth, death, and renewal, and knew through shamanic experience that although the body died, their soul would take another form in a new life. This was the origin of belief in reincarnation. We can follow the transition from the great mother of the Neolithic era to the great goddesses of the Bronze Age, goddesses such as Isis in Egypt, Inanna in Sumer, and Artemis of Ephesus, all of whom were worshipped as the queen of heaven and associated with the moon. For many thousands of years, the great mother and these great goddesses personified the principle of relationship the interconnectedness of every aspect of life, and above all, the sacredness of the great web of life. The sacred marriage of goddess and god was the greatest ceremony of the year in Egypt and Sumer, holding heaven and earth and the feminine and masculine archetypes in relation to each other. The primary question of the lunar era was, how should the human community act so as to be in harmony with the life of the cosmos? As the last speaker has said, this was of supreme importance. Out of this question came the laws that govern society and the mathematical laws that govern the cosmos. Plato, in his Timaeus, was the first to give a name to this all-embracing cosmic entity, which he described as a single living creature that encompasses all the living creatures that are within it. He called it the soul of the cosmos. The priceless insight of this era was the understanding that the cosmos has an inner life, a soul, and that this cosmic soul is the origin or ground of our own individual soul, our own consciousness. The cosmology of the lunar era begins to fade after the pre-Socratic philosophers and this statement by Plato. 
The cosmology of the subsequent solar era, which has lasted 4,000 years from circa 2000 BCE to the present day, was radically different from that of the lunar era. It is, as Owen Barfield described it, a cosmology of separation characterized by dissociation, duality, and polarization that were the result of the separation of nature from spirit. During the course of it, we lost the ancient participatory consciousness that we had had in the lunar era and the sense that we lived within a sacred order. This has only survived to our time in the indigenous cultures. The focus of this whole era is on the gradual emergence of the outstanding individual from the collective life of the tribe and the development of what we call our conscious rational mind. But it is also about a violent and traumatic separation from the deeper matrix of the soul or psyche and a severance of our relationship with nature and the earth. The drive for territorial conquest, power and dominance led by warrior kings and nation states replaced the older lunar emphasis on relationship with a harmonious cosmic order, a relationship that had been supported by precise astronomical observations gathered over millennia and celebrated in the ceremony of the sacred marriage. During the solar era, the sun replaced the moon as the primary celestial body. Between the lunar and the solar eras, there was a time in Egypt, Sumer, Greece, and Rome when goddesses and gods peopled the heavens and as in the Iliad and the Odyssey interacted with humans. Ultimately, however, in the three patriarchal religions, the great father replaced the great mother as the sole image of deity. Because of this, Western civilization developed on the foundation of a fundamental dissociation between spirit and nature, creator and creation, and between the masculine and feminine archetypes. This dissociation effectively destroyed the ancient shamanic understanding of the presence of spirit in the material world and opened the way to its exploitation. Two immensely powerful and polarizing cosmologies became the major influence on the social, political, and religious history of Western civilization. The first of these, and the principal mythic theme of the solar era, was the battle between light and darkness, good and evil, order and chaos. This polarizing cosmology, projected into the world and acted out there, led to a continual succession of wars, conquests, and the creation of vast empires, lasting until the present time. Ultimately, it would lead to the battle to conquer and subjugate nature in the service of man. The feminine archetype associated with the goddess and with nature was split off from transcendent spirit. Nature and the earth were therefore no longer sacred. Man was identified with spirit, light, and order, and woman with nature, darkness, and chaos. Man assumed a position of dominance over nature and woman, and woman's voice was silenced for 4,000 years until very recently. Her value consisted solely in her being the carrier of man's seed. The key theme of the solar era is the transcendence of nature, ascent to the light, and repudiation of the darkness associated with nature. The development of the conscious mind and humanity as a whole, together with its stupendous cultural and scientific achievements, can be recognized as the evolutionary achievement of the solar era. But this achievement gradually opened a chasm between spirit associated with mind and nature associated with the body and matter. This whole process was closely tied in to the invention of writing and the power that literacy gave to an elite group of very powerful rulers and priesthoods. Our former relationship with nature was gradually weakened as the image of deity changed from great mother to great father. The loss of the great mother and the goddess came in stages in different areas, but there was a second polarizing cosmology that accelerated their demise. This was the myth of the fall of man described in Genesis two and three. For two and a half millennia, this myth has been interpreted as divine revelation. An enormous change in Hebrew cosmology took place in 621 BCE, when monotheism was established in Judaism by a group of priests called Deuteronomists. The Jewish people once worshipped both a goddess and a god, 
a queen and a king of heaven, who together created the world. The queen of heaven was worshipped as the Holy Spirit and divine wisdom, and also as the tree of life, a cosmic tree connecting the invisible and visible worlds, whose fruit was the gift of immortality. The Deuteronomists eradicated all trace of the goddess Asherah, the queen of heaven. They then created the myth of the fall, cleverly downgrading the goddess into the human figure of Eve and bestowing on her the former title of the goddess, mother of all living. In this way, the divine feminine aspect of the Godhead was excised from Judaism, leaving Yahweh as the sole creator God. Christianity adopted this image of God, as well as the myth of the fall from Judaism. In 325 of the Christian era, the Council of Nicaea named Jesus as the only son of God, whose sacrificial death had ensured our salvation and redemption from sin. The loss of the goddess was the primary reason that we lost our relationship with nature, because in ancient civilizations, the goddess had personified nature for thousands of years, many thousands of years. In this new patriarchal cosmology, the image of deity is the transcendent great father. Divine immanence is lost. Earth is designated a place of exile and punishment for primordial sin by a vindictive God. It is no longer sacred. Adam is given dominion over the animals, but he is no longer part of the divine order. He is exiled to a world contaminated by the fall and subject to sin, suffering, and death, introduced into the world by Eve. From the perspective of our relationship with the earth, this cosmology was a disaster. Nature, split off from spirit, was effectively desold. We lost the sense of harmony and trust in the cosmos and the awareness that spirit was active and present within the world. We lost the sense of living within a sacred web of life, a sacred order. It imprinted on us a negative image of our presence on this planet and placed a heavy burden of guilt and shame, particularly sexual shame on our shoulders. Since Eve was the prime agent of the fall, she was to blame for our banishment from the Garden of Eden. And this led to the unrelenting persecution of women, reinforcing the misogyny characteristic of this whole era. If we want to understand the roots of our present environmental and spiritual crisis, we can find them in the loss of three important elements during the solar era. The divine feminine image of spirit, the direct shamanic path of communion with spirit, and the sacred marriage of the masculine and feminine aspects of the divine ground. The theme of a lost feminine value weaves like a golden thread through the mythology, poetry, and literature of Western civilization, waiting to be redeemed at the present time when the dissociation between spirit and nature might be healed. Now I come to the cosmology of Kabbalah which is the only cosmology in the West which retained the image of the divine feminine. Kabbalah is the mystical tradition of Judaism, known as the voice of the dove and the jewels of the heavenly bride. Its origins are obscure, but I believe its cosmology may have originated in the first temple in Jerusalem before it was taken over by the Deuteronomists. One of the most important images of Kabbalah is the tree of life, associated with the goddess Asherah before the takeover, which is a clear and wonderful concept describing the web of relationships which connect invisible spirit with the fabric of life in this world. The branches of the inverted tree of life extend through multiple invisible worlds or dimensions until they manifest as our world. At the innermost level or dimension of reality is the unmanifest, unknowable divine ground. At the outermost, the forms we call nature, body, and matter. In this cosmology, every aspect of creation, both visible and invisible, is interwoven with every other aspect. All is one life, one cosmic symphony, one integrated whole. We participate at this material level of creation in the divine life which informs all these levels of reality. 
our human lives are inseparable from the inner life of the cosmos. The great maxim of the Kabbalists was, as above, so below, a maxim that originated in the hermetic science taught in the temples of Egypt. The aim of the Kabbalist was and is to unite the two worlds, the invisible divine world with the world of our experience. Quintessentially, there is only one divine life. There is therefore no duality. The fundamental teaching of Kabbalah is the doctrine of emanation. And because of this, the oneness or unity of all cosmic dimensions of reality. Divine creative spirit named as the unmanifest Godhead, Ein Sof, meaning the limitless light, is regarded as totally transcendent and unknowable, but also through emanation present in every particle of the created world, as well as in the intermediary dimensions of reality veiled from our sight. We are all participants in the life of the cosmos, atoms in the being and body of God. Kabbalah did not reject this world as fallen, as did Christianity, but saw it sustained and permeated by the light of the divine ground. It taught that whatever we do in this world affects the invisible worlds and vice versa, because everything visible and invisible is connected through an indissoluble web of life. The concept of reincarnation was intrinsic to this path to God. The soul becomes enlightened over many lives, at first through attraction to, then contemplation of, and finally communion with the invisible worlds. Kabbalah is the only cosmology in the West that celebrates the indissoluble union between the feminine and masculine as aspects of the Godhead. It preserved the ancient Bronze Age image of the sacred marriage, reflected in the union of the divine mother-father in the ground of being, who are one in their ground, one in their emanation, one in their ecstatic and continuous act of creation through all the dimensions they bring into being and sustain. No other tradition offers the same breathtaking vision in such exquisite poetic imagery of the union of male and female energies in the one that is both. In this cosmology, the Shekhinah, or feminine face of the Godhead, is the co-creator of the world. She is named as divine wisdom and the Holy Spirit, and also as cosmic womb, architect of worlds, source or foundation of our world, and the radiance, word, or glory of the unknowable ground or Godhead. Text after text uses sexual imagery and the imagery of light of an unimaginable luminosity and translucence to describe how the ray emanating from the unknowable ground enters into the womb, the great sea of light or sea of glory of the celestial mother. From here, it emanates as a radiant cascade, a fountain of living water, pouring forth light to create, permeate and sustain all the worlds or dimensions it brings into being. This cascade of light flows through two branches of the tree of life into the 10 female and male vessels, powers or attributes of the divine, named as the Sephiroth. A third branch descends directly down the center, unifying and connecting the energies on either side. The last 10th sphere of creation is called Malkuth, the kingdom, where the divine mother father image is expressed as the female and male of all species. All branches of the tree of life are connected through 22 paths and nature is seen as the garment of God. All life on earth, all levels and degrees of cosmic reality, all forms of what we see and name as matter are the creation of that primal fountain of light and are therefore an expression of divinity. In the radiance of that invisible cosmic sea of light, Everything is connected to everything else as through a luminous circulatory system. Kabbalah gives us a highly developed cosmology of a conscious, intelligent, and constantly creative universe with light as the creative agent that brings our universe into being. Now I come to the current cosmology of scientific materialism or physicalism. The 4,000 year long process of separation during the solar era was largely unconscious. We have still not emerged from its influence or from the negative cosmology of the myth of the fall, 
which had gradually undermined the teaching of Christ about our innate divinity. Over recent centuries, we have reached dazzling heights of scientific, medical, and technological advances, which have transformed the condition of our lives on this planet and facilitated a phenomenal expansion of our ability to express the creative genius of our species in many different areas. But we have also suffered a catastrophic loss of soul, a loss of the ancient awareness of the sacred interweaving of all aspects of life, a loss of the sense of participation in the life of nature and the life of the cosmos, and despite all our religions, a loss of relationship with spirit. Our conscious mind, a tiny aspect of our total psyche, has become detached from the deeper matrix of the primordial soul out of which it has evolved and has become more and more inflated. It no longer has any awareness of or relationship with the psychic depths from which it has emerged, no relationship with nature or the cosmos, whose staggering extent, beauty and complexity have been revealed to us by the Hubble telescope. In the secular culture, the rational human mind has virtually replaced God and no longer recognizes a dimension of reality beyond the material universe, nor any form of consciousness transcendent to its own. As D.H. Lawrence observed in his book on the apocalypse in 1929, we have lost the cosmos. This has led with the fading of the influence of Christianity to the rise of the cosmology of scientific materialism, scientism, or physicalism, as it's recently been called, that developed during the enlightenment of the 18th century and whose basic premises have been taught in our schools and universities for over a hundred years. This cosmology presented as incontrovertible truth presents one huge problem. The material world is the only one it recognizes. The whole universe is seen as a lifeless mechanism without consciousness, purpose, intelligence or meaning. It has no conscious beings in it apart from ourselves. We are separate from the life of nature and the life of the universe, both of which are deemed to be without consciousness. The scientists who promote this materialist belief system dismiss the idea of God, the soul, and life beyond death. Consciousness is generated by the neurons of the physical brain, so when the brain dies, consciousness ceases to exist. This cosmology has led to the belief that we can control the life of the planet to the sole advantage of our species, even to the splitting of the atom and the creation of our demonic weapons of mass destruction. Seeing all aspects of the world and the universe as devoid of consciousness and separate from ourselves has led to a catastrophic loss of soul and a loss of relationship with the planetary environment and the inner life of the cosmos. According to the psychiatrist Ian McGilchrist, who has just published a brilliant book called The Matter of Things, we have become prisoners of a literal left hemispheric mind, which has closed down access to the imaginative right hemisphere and has led to this disastrous misinterpretation of reality. When the left hemispheric rational mind is promoted as the only faculty which can define the nature of reality, it possesses, as Jung pointed out, a Promethean freedom, but it also partakes of a godless hubris. Now with climate change, we, climate change, we are faced with the effects of the loss of our relationship with the earth and the ancient awareness that we live within a sacred order. We contemplate wars in space, and pollute it with our debris. World leaders vie for power with each other, oblivious of the insanity of what they are doing. If there is a single idea that is facilitating the subjugation of nature and the devastation of the planet, it is the belief that the earth has no consciousness. It doesn't matter how we treat matter. Awakening to a new story is an evolutionary imperative at this time of unprecedented crisis to free us from the scientific beliefs and the left hemispheric perspective that has increasingly imprisoned us. Without this awakening, we have no future as a species. The new story coming into being is that the whole universe is a unified field 
In the words of physicist Nassim Haramein, a new cosmology is being born, a new vision of our profound relationship with a conscious, intelligent, and interconnected universe. This new cosmology invites what Owen Barfield called final participation, when we are reunited with that from which we have become separated. There is an emerging consensus among certain physicists, astrophysicists, and cosmologists that consciousness, not matter, is the primary ground of reality, that the material world exists within consciousness. Amit Goswami, in his book, The Self-Aware Universe, states unequivocally that consciousness is the ground of all being and quantum physics makes this as clear as daylight. These scientists are seeing the universe as a living organism with the seen and unseen aspects of it functioning as a unified whole. As Plotinus said long ago, everything breathes together. Our consciousness is part of an underlying field not separate from it and certainly not created by the neurons of the physical brain. Each of us carries the holographic imprint of the entire universe within us. No matter what our race, nation, gender or caste, we are all equally part of the living, breathing, connecting web of life, which underlies and connects all forms in the universe and on our planet. Following Plato, I call this web of life the soul of the cosmos. I prefer the word soul to mind because it carries a feminine residence. This doesn't exclude mind or field, but I like it to be included as one of a trinity, as it were. With the discovery of the quantum planum underlying our space-time reality, we find the idea returning after a 4,000 year absence of a cosmic womb out of which all that we call reality arises and to which we, it may return similar to the outbreathing and inbreathing of the great cosmic cycles posited, posited by the Vedic sages of India. The realization that we participate in a cosmic consciousness that is the source and ground of our own consciousness could shatter the belief that material reality is all there is, that we exist in a randomly created universe and that there is no life beyond death. The discoveries now being made challenge what science has programmed us to believe, that we as humans are separate from all other species and from the life of the planet and the universe. The astounding discoveries of quantum physics tell us that our world of matter is like a visible foam resting on a very deep ocean of light that permeates every cell of our being. We are not only connected with each other through the astonishing reach of the internet, but through the infinitesimal particles of subatomic matter. In our essence, we are not fallen beings, but beings of light, cosmic beings, incarnated on this planet for an evolutionary purpose. All life at the deepest level is essentially one, and each of us is an expression of the one, inseparable from it nor are we alone in the universe. There is emerging evidence from ancient cultures that our planet has been visited repeatedly by inhabitants from other planetary systems. I see this great revelation that is happening as the fulfillment of what I call the dream of the cosmos. It's longing for us to recover the relationship we once had with it and take it further. We are rediscovering at a new turn of the spiral of evolution what was known to shamans millennia ago in the lunar culture of the Great Mother and described in minute detail in the cosmology of Kabbalah. We are not separate from the divinity we have been worshiping for thousands of years, but are an intrinsic part of its life, its mind and its soul. The greatest spiritual teachers have told us that we carry divinity within our nature, but the religions of the world have not transmitted that knowledge to us. Divinity is the ground of all that we call life. At the heart of the cosmos is a love of unimaginable dimensions, a love that sustains the entire universe and is the origin of our own capacity to love and to create. In 1600, before he was burnt at the stake by the Inquisition, because he refused to deny that God was present in nature, Giordano Bruno said, a single force, love, 
links and gives life to infinite worlds. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. You took us on an amazing journey from ancient Egypt through Western culture to the Kabbalah to science to modern day new paradigm cosmologies. Thank you for doing that.